Hello and a huge welcome to panel five question and answer session. My name is Toby Harden and for the next 30 minutes we're discussing displacement and population movement. Described as a continent on the move, Africa experiences both conflict induced and disaster induced migration flows from refugees to labour migration and of course internal displacement both domestically and cross border. Over 31 million Africans live outside the country of their birth and the majority still within the African continent. The panel five discussion touched on the effects of continent wide security issues such as border crime, extremist groups, human trafficking and smuggling, as well as issues such as human rights and international protection. We discussed also the effects that these challenges are having on the COVID-19 pandemic and its spread and the need for safe, secure shelters and stable environments. We finished with our panelists highlighting two takeaway points each, which for reference were the need to prioritize political and economic steps on how Africa can bounce back and recover from population movement and displacement, how we can work better together and in partnerships with the shared aim of a recovery in Africa, how we can address the displacement of thousands of people currently in camps, the effect it is having on the young generation, the children, and the need to integrate into local regional society, how to work with international support, host nations and regional areas in using funding appropriately in the right place and at the right time, how to create multi-layer flexible funding that is not ring fenced for specific items in specific timeframes, and how to localize international frameworks so that there is honest dialogue and communication across community and also at sub-district level. Our panelists, uh, some of whom have returned for the Q&A session um, and some of whom sadly haven't. So Dr. Asha Mohammed, who was Secretary General of the Kenyan Red Cross Society, sadly can't join us today. But luckily, we are joined by Mr. Coyote Fagbimi, the Director of Relief and Rehabilitation in Nigeria from NEMA, and Mr. Maxwell Sidhansana, the Director of Southern African Regional Office from the World Vision International. So many, many, uh, many welcome to you. We've got some, we've got three questions, I think, to start us going. Uh, we've got 30 minutes. Well, actually, we've only got 25 minutes now because I've taken five minutes. Um, so let me start off with the first question. Uh, and that is, what are the different types of displacement and population movement in the African region? And perhaps, Mr. Coyote, I could ask you to start our discussion with that question. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to join you. Um, I think I'm having a hand back here. So let me just um, make a little adjustment. Hello. Hello. Perfect. Mr. Cody, can you please close the browser that you were watching the content on because that's what's making the noise you have zoom uh, okay. open and the website and so it's hearing itself thank you okay thank you okay um the type of displacement in africa and i think um using nigeria as um um, a typical case, we have displacement due to natural hazards. I do not want to call it natural disasters because we, we in disaster risk reduction, we say there are no natural disasters, there are natural hazards. Disasters are not natural. Uh, it is hazards that are natural, but because of what we do, we uh, cause this natural hazard to become disaster. So, um, the first is uh, those due to natural hazards, and uh, such natural hazards as flood, and um, um, flood on its own is not a disaster. It is the interaction of human, of man, and and the flood that becomes um, disaster. So those that are affected, we know many people in Africa because of the need for water. They live on the floodplain, so. They live on the floor plain, and because uh, when when we have um, high intensity rainfall 
or long time rainfall, it causes flood and they are affected. So that is one, those affected by natural hazard. We also have those you know, that are affected by drought uh, because um, they, they are clubs and they are, they, they, and, and they are, they are so bad grazing, they, they are affected. They have to move from their community and move to other communities and they become displaced. So that is one. Second type, you know, are those that are caused by uh, insurgency. As I said, we have, we have insurgency, for instance, in the Northeast. We have current problems in, um, in Ethiopia and, and uh, people, because of the, those, you know, uh, fighting with the government or fighting for certain purposes, people are displaced. So um, this could be related to those caused by war. Uh, so we say war, insurgency or whatever. And then the third type, uh, those that um, are, are caused in Nigeria, particularly by what I call uh, criminalities. You know, I think that um, uh, crime, uh, uh, as well as, you know, we have people like ISIS, uh, used to have ISIS, West Africa, and all that, Boko Haram. Um, and so we have also some criminals that goes to deprive people of uh, their, their, their livelihoods and all that and attack communities unawares. And uh, this is also related to headers farmers conflicts or what you call community, communal clashes between one community and, uh, and the other for economic purposes or whatever reason. So these um, people are displaced. And when they are displaced, um, they are displaced in other communities, not where they are naturally, um, they, where they naturally inhabit or where they have their farm lands. You know, we've got, we have a kind of um, land tenure system where people own lands, where they cultivate and they live and all that, and they are attached to those land. So many people are displaced. And when they are displaced, they are, some are being in, kept in camps, official camps, there are those in non-official camps. There are those in host communities where they are, the, the communities give them you know, a certain land. OK, you can stay for now. And then there are those who also we call those in liberated areas. Liberated areas are areas where uh, have been taken over by insurgents, for instance, in, in Nigeria and the Northeast. And then you know, because of um, the gov government overpowering them, they are kept in a community, all of them. And in order to provide enough security, you know, they are kept together in a camp-like system. So these are the three types we have that I'm, I know um, for now, or maybe uh, four. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Coyote. So uh, just to summarize there, we, we've got sort of those three main areas. Uh, which is natural disasters, it's the, the war fighting, the, the fighting against governments, it's the criminal elements, uh, the community clashes, that is then creating huge amounts of displaced personnel. And of course, the issues with those displaced peoples are that they're, um, uh, they're being put into other communities that are far from their own homelands, they're being put into camps, which is then creating a whole load of issues. Uh, Mr. Maxwell, would you, would you agree with that? Is there anything you would add to those? Yes, I, I think uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Yoda has uh, highlighted uh, the causes and also uh, the settlements are related uh, to the different uh, causes. Uh, but in broad terms, we can also highlight that they are refugees, uh, those that move uh, into a neighboring country or a country other than the country of their origin uh, and uh, they are registered or classified to say by UNHCR uh, as refugees and closely associated with that you have asylum seekers who have not been classified as refugees but uh, uh, seek uh, some kind of provision from a host government uh, that uh, would probably provide a temporary uh, residence permit that allows uh, the asylum uh, seeker who might be uh, fleeing from political uh, tensions uh, and they believe that they are some kind of target and uh, they seek accommodation within 
a country other than their own. Then I think broadly, uh, what Mr. Kaede uh, highlighted that internally displaced uh, populations, which uh, for various reasons end up away uh, from uh, their original uh, area of uh, residence. But uh, uh, when you uh, look uh, at uh, uh, the displaced people as well, it is always difficult sometimes to define uh, categorically uh, what uh, uh, the person lies in. And often until a person gets a refugee certificate, for instance, they will always be referred to as a person of concern. It means that they have been displaced, uh, but uh, uh, there has not been any categoric definition of where they uh, lie. And some of these may be people that have been displaced or that have moved uh, and even illegally crossed the borders, uh, not because they've been pushed out uh, by any aggressor, but maybe for uh, economic reasons, they have uh, to go and find uh, alternative uh, uh, livelihoods in a different country, but without uh, the necessary papers. I'll stop here. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, uh, because this period of time that people are now living in camps is, is getting longer and longer and longer, we're then getting into that situation, which we touched on in the panel discussion, that you are getting uh, the young generation, the children, who are now growing up in these camps, and, and their, their uh, roots may lie in one part of Africa, but actually the camp lies in a different part of Africa. And, and so there is a discussion now on, on what, what do we do with that young generation, because they don't necessarily want to be repatriated across a border to somewhere that they don't know. Uh, they, they may well want to stay where they are. Is there, is, there, is, there, is there something that we should be addressing to try and uh, um, to try and work out how we move forward with this, Mr. Coyote? Yeah, uh, yes, I, I think so. That's what you need to do. Both, um, you know, okay, you you don't stop the creation because you are in camp, or you because you are in a refugee, or because you are a displaced person. I mean, we they have rights. And these children that are born, the children that are born, you know, in those countries should be uh, integrated. Uh, if you have, you know, I don't know, if you have somebody traveling and then uh, by air and he gets to a country and gives back, will you say that um, he not, should not be taken to the hospital, he should not be given a certificate of birth and all that? So I think we should, human rights um, issues should enable us to know that those children uh, that um, I either uh, giving back to, that have, they don't know any other place, they, sh they, they, they should be integrated. They are citizens of, uh, of uh, the world. And uh, those problems are not caused by them, maybe not even caused by their parents, but some, by somebody else. So one, yeah. we should yeah, take yeah. care of the, the young generation, either uh, you know, those who lost their parents or the, who, who, who missed their parents, I you know, all those who are born in uh, where they are displaced as a refugee or as RDP, I think um, uh, we should not uh, 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 discard them. We should have a special provision for them. Because if we yeah. don't, yeah. You, you, we, are, we, we are building another generation that will, will grow up to be angry with the world. You know, because exactly. you know, if, if they are not well treated and they, they, they never knew anywhere and they, you know, you, you, we, we are not, they are not well treated, they are not well cared for and they know that it was not the problems. That, I mean, they, I, I think they will grow up being angry with the society. And well, I think we might have just lost uh, Mr. Coyote there, but your, your point is really well made. The, the, the children, the young generation in these camps, th these are the future scientists, the future doctors, the future leaders, the future political uh, leaders. The, they are the future of Africa. And, and so they need to be nurtured. They need to be integrated. They need to be cared for. They need to be educated. They need to be able to spread their wings and, and, uh, and live their life uh, free of, of, of all the issues that they've grown up in. And, and also with... Uh, with, with every help possible to, to then go and make a difference so that they're not growing up angry as, as, um, as, as Mr. Kirby was saying. Um, so it's, um, it's a huge issue, a huge issue.
Um, and I suppose one of the one of the areas in order to try and um, uh, combat that issue is then funding. Um, and we know that funding is is not always in the right place at the right time. We know that funding can be ring fenced for uh, some areas where actually maybe it needs to go into another area. Uh, and we know that probably a, a degree of that is is the lack of honest communication at the right level. Uh, so, Mr. Maxwell, have you have you got anything you can pull into that? Thank you so much, uh, Toby. Yes, uh, funding has been. Uh, a major uh, issue uh, in terms of uh, uh, enabling uh, countries that are hosting, uh, say, the displaced populations to actually integrate them, even those that have expressed an interest and might uh, even have uh, land to, uh, to host those people and get them to be integrated within the communities. I think the challenge uh, has often been placed on the hosting countries or hosted to having this uh, as a global uh, issue where different uh, governments would also uh, need to contribute to a particular uh, country. So uh, refugees that are in Zambia should not just be uh, seen as a burden for Zambia alone. They have to be uh, seen uh, as a burden for the whole globe. Uh, and Zambia should actually be thanked for hosting uh, these but uh, uh, then they, their fiscal should not be stretched as a result of uh, uh, the refugees because they have not uh, willfully uh, accommodated these people, but they have uh, uh, out of a humanitarian uh, cause uh, accommodated them. And the way that sometimes even when the funding is available, uh, it is available for a short term, uh, and yet the processes that uh, need to be undertaken for a meaningful integration of uh, uh, the displaced people might be lengthy. Uh, just linking to the point of uh, uh, how we can deal with the children that are born uh, in refugee camps or in host communities, but uh, to a refugee families. Sometimes even without being accorded the status of being citizens or permanent residents of uh, the countries in which they are hosted, they need documentation that will enable them to get into school. Uh, and that process of uh, just documenting uh, these children and proving that they've been uh, born from the families that they uh, belong to, it takes time. So when you uh, then get funding that says it's a one year funding, uh, when in fact we know the process of just uh, establishing uh, the identity or the relationship uh, between the affected uh, child uh, and uh, the parents or the people that are claiming uh, to be parents, can take longer than that period of time. Uh, and then the funding sometimes expires or eventually it is redirected at something else because there's a, a view uh, that uh, it has not been spent. But uh, the point uh, is that processes relating to the documentation and uh, also integration uh, of uh, uh, these people of concern take time and it is critical uh, to use whatever resources that are available and have the flexibility that allows uh, those processes to be completed. But also largely to uh, have this as a shared burden uh, where uh, all uh, governments, all uh, stakeholders can uh, call together and contribute uh, funding uh, that uh, then allows uh, the host government to have flexibility to deploy the resources based on the priorities of uh, the displaced people. Yeah, I mean, great point. It, it's that it's that multi-layer funding, isn't it, that focuses not just on a short-term solution, but focuses on a much longer-term solution to allow then time for other processes to, to take place. Because we know, as that great example you've used for the documentation of the children, those processes can take such a such a large time um, and that if funding is just earmarked or ring fenced for a much smaller period, it, it, it's, it's scratching the surface and it's frustrating and it's just creating more issues. Um, we've, uh, we, wel we welcome back, uh, uh, Mr. Coyote, welcome back. I wonder if you've got anything else that you want to throw in on the, uh, on the funding side. Okay, thank you. I, I apologize. I think, uh, I don't know, the um, network just went off. Um, Yes, um, funding is very critical. Uh, and I think most time, 
because um, fundings are not uh, done um, with a proper uh, planning, what I call the kind of having humanitarian overview of a, of a country or of a situation, and then developing a plan for it. We, what we discover is that different uh, organizations, NGOs and the uh, NGOs just uh, see an opportunity and then they come together. I mean, they go to and they make proposals to secure funding. But I, I think um, there should be proper coordination by the nation on each of those cases of uh, displacement. So let's let, let the country have a figure, what should be done, let there be proper planning for, uh, for, uh, in, uh, for a year or two, which we should even lead, not just for humanitarian, to development. Because we see that mm -hmm. the UN is trying to promote um, humanitarian development nexus. We, saw, we see the humanitarian mm -hmm. actors, they are just act, act out of humanitarian uh, interventions from year to year, they just want to continue. And when you are talking about development, some of them are not happy. They, are, they, they don't think that you should be talking about development. And then the development actors mm -hmm. are working in silos. So I think that we should all work towards migrating from humanitarian to development. And that will ensure that mm -hmm. we, are, we have a plan for uh, a proper plan for the funding how the fund is going to be used to tackle each sectors of that affecting the people. Actually, when you keep people in a camp or in a displaced area, you have gotten mm -hmm. a country or a state or whatever local government, a, a county, you have gotten them there. You need to talk about their health, you need to talk about their education, you need to talk about their protection, you need to talk about their food and non-food item, you need to talk about every aspect of their life. So it's not just, Okay, I'm, target, I'm targeting food, I'm targeting shelter, and, and, and that's all. No, we should see that. How do we transit from the temporary shelter to uh, a permanent shelter? How do we integrate these people? And so the funding should be applied to empowering them. If after two years, after three years, after five years, if people are integrated, do they have capacity to produce their own life level? So we should be uh, capacitating them when they are when they are in the camp or wherever they are. So these are the the proper coordination is necessary. I know that coordination is one of the difficult things to do among people that don't have the same sources of fund, that don't um, have the same uh, you know uh, 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 plan. But if we can plan together, you know, we, we will be able to solve each and every problem in ensuring that. The funding that are coming, either locally or from donors, or are applied, and we can project for some years to make sure that there's transition from humanitarian intervention alone, getting to get into resilience development. Thank you very much. Uh, I, th I think that is some fantastic points you've made there. That whole development, the the whole. Um, uh localization of the international frameworks um it's it's not having the um uh, the international framework itself thinking that they know the answer because what they've got to do is to make sure that that framework is localized and so that you've got that open and honest dialogue in the right areas not sitting up high without really understanding how the development works but actually getting into that sub-district level, getting into that community level um, uh, and ensuring that they've then got local action plans that are put into place at the right level of implementation uh, rather than an unseen international organization not really understanding where it's at. Um, would, would you agree with that, Maxwell? Yes, that's uh, an important factor in terms of uh, actually the implementation of uh, the big uh, plans that have been put in place at an international level. Uh, but uh, even when uh, the national governments uh, maybe accede uh, to this, I think the challenge has been uh, on the operational process of uh, making that uh, to happen. Uh, and often uh, you find that uh, it's localized at national level 
but the people are not living at national level. They are living within the local uh, communities. And often even for governments that uh, host the refugees, they would uh, uh, set up camps uh, as far away from anyone else as possible. I think it's more for administration in terms of uh, knowing who is uh, staying away. So uh, the location of the camp may not take into account uh, the long-term plan uh, to uh, locally integrate these. And when uh, that uh, uh, local integration is uh, started, often uh, if it's outside of uh, this uh, camp, for instance, you need a whole set of infrastructure uh, that uh, uh, would enable livelihoods and decent uh, life. Uh, and also uh, because uh, livelihoods depend uh, on being actors within different value chains. And if uh, these people are cut off from uh, the rest of the civilization, then even the private sector actors may not find it economically viable uh, to get into uh, some of these areas where people have uh, uh, been uh, locally uh, integrated from the context of it's more like a geographical uh, integration or land integration, but not with the rest of the people or with the rest of uh, uh, the markets. Uh, so, and also in some instances, even where uh, the people are living within urban centers. So these are not people that are uh, within camps, uh, but uh, the tone that is set, say, by local authorities may uh, always alienate uh, the, the, the refugees or uh, people of concern uh, because they are seen uh, as uh, some kind of scourge as opposed to uh, people that uh, uh, probably had uh, good lives where they come from, but because of circumstances, uh, they were forced to, to leave their homes. And the tone that is sent uh, by the local leaders or by the local faith leaders uh, may uh, determine the acceptability uh, of uh, uh, the people. But if we still use the same stakeholders to communicate more positively about how uh, the people that have been displaced can be integrated within uh, the provisions of the different frameworks, then they could be uh, on an annual basis, uh, because most governments have some kind of decentralization, uh, the, whatever has been accepted or agreed to at national level has to be reflected in the planning uh, programs of uh, the different local authorities uh, so that uh, uh, that uh, effort can actually uh, be implemented on the ground. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, great, great point. I mean, integration is so important. Um, Sadly, we are we're almost running out of time now. Uh, we're, we're right on that uh, that 30 minute that we are allowed. But uh, I want to steal a little bit of extra time because this has been a really fascinating discussion and something that uh, that I think needs needs airing. Um, so just as a summary, what we have touched on, we've touched on um, the the reasons for the displacement. Uh, and we've looked at uh, the, those sort of three main areas. Uh, that uh, Mr. Coyote mapped out, which was the sort of the natural hazards, the, the fighting against the governments and, and the criminal activity. Uh, we then started to have a really fa fascinating discussion uh, in terms of the funding and, and where that needs to happen and how that needs to be multi-layered um, and how it needs to get into the right areas so that that can then allow the young generations to, to succeed uh, and for them to blossom into our future leaders, our future politicians, our future scientists, our future doctors, so that they can help uh, the recovery of Africa. Uh, and we then started to uh, look uh, more into the integration, how important the integration is. Um, uh, and, and these are all huge topics in themselves. And we've just literally scratched the surface in 30 minutes. Um, what, what, I, what I'll do now is, is, in closing, do what I did on the uh, discussion, which is just allow you both to have just your, your last takeaway point that you would like the wider community to, to take away so that they can go and discuss in their own organizations. Um, so uh, perhaps I could start with you, Mr. Coyote, just one final point, just uh, as, a, as a sort of a main plea to the international community who are listening to this. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I think what I lastly I want to say is to say that we should not um, be weary um, in well doing, and uh, that's to say wherever 
uh, their needs are, uh, the, the, the citizens um, that are displaced anywhere, which um, uh, they, 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 they don't have, um, you know, cause, they were not the cause, they were not the reason for, for that. Uh, we should continue to ensure that we are able to give them some sense of dignity and uh, humanity to make sure that, you know, they can come back and they uh, have uh, their life back. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah. And dignity and humanity, I mean, two such important words. Uh, and the final final words from you, Mr. Maxwell. Yeah, I, I would want to highlight uh, that uh, there are governments that have opened up their borders to host uh, people that have been displaced. And let us not make it their sole burden uh, to host uh, these displaced people. This is a collective burden. And in line with what Mr. Coyote has said, let's contribute uh, to minimizing that burden to governments that have opened a space uh, for displaced people. Thank you. Perfect, perfect. And, and great sentiments to finish on. Uh, so gentlemen, it's been a pleasure getting to know you for these last couple of days and having these discussions. Um, it's been of, uh, a good ed education for me. Um, and it's been important to air these, these very important discussion points. So thank you very much indeed for your time. Uh, and to the wider community, thank you very much indeed for listening uh, and for taking part and for sending your questions in. Um, thank you so much. God bless. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you.